So welcome everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Cynthia Matusek. So Cynthia is an assistant professor of computer science and electrical engineering at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Uh, Cynthia directs UMBC's Interactive Robotics and Language Lab, in which research is focused on robotics, acquisition of grounded language, including work in human-robot interfaces, natural language, machine learning, and collabor uh, collaborative robot learning. She has developed a number of algorithms and approaches that make it possible for robots to learn about their environment and how to follow instructions from interactions with non-technical end users. She received a PhD in computer science and engineering from the University of Washington in 2014. And Cynthia has published in AI, robotics, and human-robot interaction venues and was named in the most recent triple, um, IEEE biannual 10 to Watch in AI. So it's a great pleasure to have Cynthia here. So Cynthia and I overlapped in Seattle for, I don't know, about two years. And I really enjoyed working with her on, uh, on a chess playing robot. Maybe I'm not sure whether she's going to mention this later, but that was quite an, quite an interesting experience for both of us. So uh, thanks for joining us today, Cynthia. I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for the lovely introduction. Okay, so I want to go ahead and dive right in here and introduce the core topic that I'm going to be talking about, which is essentially the overlap between robotics and natural language processing. And I'll start by explaining the fit there. Uh, we've been talking a lot in the last few years about robotic collaboration with people. How can robots be productive in human-centric environments, not just in laboratory environments or, you know, fixed factory settings. And one of the takeaways from that is that good collaboration requires communication. It is necessary to be talking to the people that you're trying to interact with, or at least communicating with the people that you're trying to interact with. And that is pretty much core to all of the kinds of successful interactions that we've seen in any groups. When I say successful interactions, what I mean here is quite limited. I mean, or <laughs> it's quite limited theoretically. It does what a human wants. It's successful if the person comes away from the interaction satisfied. One of the obvious ways to do communication is using natural language. Um, natural language is the core of how people interact with one another. The development of language marks the, a sea change in the development of the human race. And you can use it to tell people what to do, um, tell them how to interact with you, tell them about things in the world. Mm -hmm. But language itself is hard, right? So I'm going to talk specifically here about what's called grounded language. And grounded language interactions and grounded language acquisition have become a pretty hot field of study in a number of areas. So just a quick word of warning here. There are a lot of people are working on natural language or on grounded language in natural language and in vision and in robotics. But uh, those subgroups do not all mean the same thing by grounded or by grounded language. So grounded language acquisition revolves around the idea that language doesn't exist in a vacuum. Language is grounded. It means something with respect to the physical world that we operate in. So Stephen Harnad defined the symbol grounding problem by saying essentially that symbols must be connected directly to the things in the world that they refer to. Symbols in a vacuum just floating around in space are meaningless in their own right. And if you want grounded language, then you need to learn that language from interaction with the world. It's really hard to understand what the word green means or what left means just based on a dictionary definition. And a lot of the traditional, very symbolic AI approaches to learning language, which I've been heavily involved in in the past, are essentially right definitions like this that we see on the bottom. And that's pretty far removed from how you actually learn what an apple is, right? You learn what things are by interacting with them, picking them up, holding them, touching them. And that's the core of the grounded language acquisition idea. So robots are useful. Uh, robots need language because interacting with humans well, uh, using language is something that people understand. 
So why does language need robotics? And in, to answer that pop quiz, um, just take, just figure out what did the human say in this context? You know, what, what's happening here? Okay, what about now? And that's only a question you can really answer meaningfully in the context of what's happening, not just what did a person say, but what are they trying to get somebody to accomplish and what is the robot doing? Um, and, you know, natural language and robotics fit very well together, but every piece of this requires learning. The reason it requires learning broadly is that collaboration is consistent, consists of multiple pieces, control of some kind plus communication. And language is a natural mechanism by which people interact gracefully, understand one another already, uh, but it can support very unforeseen spaces. It's a huge space. There's a lot to natural language. There's even more to the physical world that language occurs in. So everything on the slide, all of the objects on this slide, believe it or not, are typical cooking implements in some context. None of these is a particularly exotic object um, in different settings in the world. So I don't know if anybody recognizes any of these. Often I would ask for a show of hands, but uh, you know, take a moment and see no, nothing here, as I, I claim, nothing here would be odd to find in the kitchen counter of somebody that you, on the kitchen counter of somebody that you know, but none of them is something that standard pre-trained Western oriented language models necessarily, or vision models necessarily have a good handle on. You have to learn things as you go. People have idiosyncratic interactions with the world and use idiosyncratic language in those interactions. And the world itself is just really, really big, even just limited to objects. There's a lot in it. And we can't preconceive of everything that a human might want to say to a robot or interact with a robot over. Trying to preconceive that is, you know, is a trap. So. Another way of thinking of grounding, and this is all different pieces of work that I've done and some of my colleagues have done is we've talked about naming objects in the world or following directions, go to the end of the hall and turn left, or describing sets of objects using gesture as well as language. All of these, I claim, can, can be considered rather than purely as semantic problems, they can be considered as classification problems. When you say this is a lemon to someone or you try to teach a robot to understand instructions, what you're really doing is trying to get a robot that can handle these interactions, or a robot that can get a lemon for you, or can answer questions about which way someone went, or can you know, interact with blocks that are described by shape rather than by name. But all of those, if you look at it this way, all of these are classification questions, right? We're classifying objects and actions. And if you treat it that way, if you say basically a lot of grounded language boils down to, a lot of language boils down to classifying objects and actions and settings in the world, um, then the learning problem becomes a bit clearer. Your training data can be, you know, natural language and things in the world, which gets translated into some formal representation. And that formal representation can then be applied to the world in order to help determine you know, what, what, which of these things uh, meets the characteristics being described. And so you can do this by learning classifiers for the visual components, parsers for the natural language components. And this is sort of the typical way of approaching, it's sort of the early way of approaching natural language grounding. And this is what a lot of people mean when they say grounding is figure out how to translate the world and some utterance into a machine usable representation. Now, I don't know how many people here have a natural language background, um, but the problem here is what if the formal concepts don't exist in the representation? So if you go back to the previous slide, um, I don't necessarily have formal representations pre-existing in my language 
for each of these objects or even the characteristics of each of these objects. So what do you do in that case? What do you do in this sort of open world case? And what you want to do is learn completely new language about completely new objects from the interactions that you're having with people. So you're starting with very little at that point. Uh, you're doing open set classification or you know, open world recognitions to of the broad categories that this, this fits into. And like here we're saying all of these blocks are yellow when the robot has not seen anything yellow previously and doesn't have any seated notion of what language means. Um, this is a hard problem, right? Language is big. There are a lot of different things that can be said about objects in the world, even like even if you're just focusing on relatively simple attributes. And the approach to this that I have always taken, that my group takes, is first form hypotheses based on everything you see and then use the physical context, the world state that this is all occurring in, to disambiguate among those contexts, among those hypotheses. So I do speak rather quickly, by the way, so please feel free at any point, I should have said this earlier, please feel free to stop me, ask questions, um, you know, give me, give me feedback on whether I'm going too quickly and Mark and Sarah will be relaying that. Okay, so when we talk about this, learn from language and objects in the world, this can be treated as a problem of, of joint modeling, where you're trying to build a joint model of both the language that's describing things and the world that that's occurring in. So the experimental setup might be something like you see on the left here, uh, we've got three cylinders, a red cylinder, a blue cylinder, and a yellow cylinder. We've got the speech that somebody's using to describe that, and we've got the gestures that they are using to convey the things that they're talking about as they go. Uh, on the right is sort of a high level, how does that work? Uh, we've got a language model that turns something like these, the blue ones, into a classifier. We've got a perception model that subdivides objects in the world. I would like to note that these labels are purely for human convenience. Uh, we don't, if we've never seen terms like blue or green or round or whatever before, it's not, we can't really um, give them human meaningful labels. And you combine, after some training, you combine that language model and that world model into a query against the world state that hopefully gives you, these are the blue ones, gives you the grounding that's correct for that query. And you do this, I do this partly with a clever use of objective functions, uh, which I'll describe further. So the core idea here is that you can treat learning, you can treat learning language and language grounding as a learning problem, where in training, you've got the language, you've got the objects that are perceived in the world. And here I'm talking about objects you can actually, and we have actually, used the exact same infrastructure for instructions and actions, for following instructions in a map, for example. So this is an object specific, uh, conceptually. Uh, you've got language describing some set of objects. You've got the complete set of objects in the world, and you have the grounding that is some execution trace or gesture or information that conveys which of the objects connects those, the language and the correct object. Uh, Cynthia, your uh, sound is gone. My sound is gone. Is that better? I mean, I, it hasn't stopped for me. I can hear you fine. All right. Yeah, I Mark, can, hear you. can you hear me now? Same, yeah. Okay. When did it cut out? Are we good? I think it's just Mark. I don't think you've cut out. Okay. Um, Mark, for his sins, has seen me talk a number of times, so I'll keep going and we can catch up afterwards. So we've got the language, the objects, and the trace, the world trace that connects those things. Um, we've got 
at during test time during training time and at testing time we've got language this is Google cube we've got the things in the world that the object uh, that the robot can see and the goal what we're going to come up with is hopefully uh, the correct grounding the correct interpretation of what was said okay. so the task description here is something like take new language structures in the world here. We're just talking about a single word, but it doesn't have to be. Create formal expressions based on that language and use those formal, uh, formal expressions to denote novel classifiers, classifiers that are come up with on the fly and trained based on instructions given by people in the world to correctly connect and classify the ground truth for some piece of terminology. Okay. So perhaps before I go into the formalism of how that's accomplished, I'll stop and check if there are any questions so far. Um, does this all make sense conceptually? Okay. I'll assume that means yes for now. So a little more formally, a little more formally, um, what we want to do here is learn a language model that parses from natural language to a formal expression. Again, here the formal expression is human readable for convenience. And a perceptual model that where terms in the formal expression denote classifiers for objects, where we're grouping objects together by trait um, or actions together by type or whatever. And given the output of those classifiers, we can treat the formal expression as a query against the perceived world state, um, which then gives us the grounded language results, the correct grounded language results. And all of, beg your pardon, and all of those pieces tie into this joint optimization goal, this joint objective, where we're trying to, we're trying to get the grounding that is the correct combination of, of things being referred to from the formal interpretation and an interpretation of the world based on what's said and what's observed. More specifically, we want to compute the probability of an indicated set G conditioned on the natural language sentence X and the perceived set of objects O. We do this by summing over two latent structures, uh, Z, which is the formal expression derived from X, and W, which is the probability of a world. So that's just the probabilities of the individual classifier assignments for all the objects. Um, so this gives us a final joint model for selecting the named objects G. So the models are trained independently, uh, but then we specify a joint probability by coupling them with this final term here. And that's a conditional probability term that holds the first to an agreement. So by observing G, which is the actual ground truth, Z and W, which is the formal interpretation and the perceptual interpretation, are a, a dependency is introduced between those and the final term. So this sort of conceptually underpins a lot of the work that's going on in my lab. Uh, this idea that you can treat language as an inductive bias for understanding perception and perception as an inductive bias for understanding language. And those are held in agreement by what you see in the world, by people actually pointing at things or handing the robot something, something or performing an action or giving the robot feedback on whether it's doing the right thing. So to talk a little bit about the results of trying this, and this, these are results for just doing, again, object attributes, uh, colors and shapes and object types. Um, I want to explain what you're about to see here, or, which is on the x-axis, we've got new classifiers of various kinds, some of which are predefined. Uh, we initialize the system with an understanding of some basic attributes, although it turns out we don't have to and many of which are created on the fly. So hypothesizing that this is some, some term 
refers to a new color that we've never seen before, or a new shape that we've never seen before. Or maybe it's a null term. It doesn't mean anything in the language that we can understand. And on the y-axis here, we've just got natural language tokens. And this process creates tens of thousands of new words, just interacting with people over something as simple as uh, toys and blocks and fruit on a table creates thousands and thousands of, of, of unique words in a data set and hundreds of thousands of new classifiers. So this is obviously just a subselection of those. But here down the left-hand side, we've got something like red, green, yellow, uh, square, cube, arch, and these three lines here down at the end are maybe like that and uh and toy. So what we see here in this top left, and these are basically, these can be thought of as the weights linking a particular classifier with a particular token. So as more training data is seen, um, some specific classifier like new color classifier one becomes very strongly associated with the word red. And these are very strong because they're colors colors are relatively fast to learn, even in shifting lighting effect situations and things. Down here are shapes. Shapes are harder to learn, particularly the 0 0.6 is cylinder, and cylinders look very different from different angles depending on the angle of the robot as it happens to be looking at them when the person's talking. And this final column, the non null hypothesis, uh, is very low, but this is, the words here are that and uh and toy, which is to say they're words that are meaningful primarily, um, they're not really meaningful in the data set of attributes, in the learned space of attributes. The word that isn't something that we can interpret to mean a particular object. And what's important is that that null interaction, the fact that that word doesn't mean anything, is being learned. All of these weights are being learned. Um, and what that means, essentially, is that the random <clears throat> classifier, the classifier that says this doesn't mean anything in particular, is actually performing better than any hypothesis that the word that denotes a color or a shape or any other attribute. So, this is a neat approach. Um, the formalism is surprisingly model agnostic. I'm not talking about much about the perceptual formula formalism here or the language formalism. I don't know if there are any language people here. It's categorical combinatory grammars, CCGs, combinatory categorical grammars. Because this formalism, this high level approach to linking things is agnostic to the specific models being used. Um, those models can actually be pulled out and replaced with different things, which is why it's so feasible to switch from attributes to object types or to actions or whatever. And it's applicable to arbitrary modalities. Uh, we can take the same data set, assuming there's language, assuming there's language. Uh, we can apply this to vision or to depth vision or to formalized traces of actions. But the fact that this is both model agnostic and somewhat data agnostic inevitably means that it's a very data hungry approach. Um, we need to see a lot of descriptions of things in the world to disambiguate the choices. And I'll come back to that. But one of the takeaways, one of the, the insights here that I hope, uh, I hope is becoming clearer and I want to now call out is that physically grounded language and percepts have a shared embedding in some latent space. That is, there's some connection when I say, you know, a snowman, and there are, there's some connection to an object in the world, and we can't observe that connection. That connection is provided by the whole of, you know, learned language and perception, but that non-observable connection is the grounding. And if you treat it as such, if you assume the shared embedding is already present, then there's a lot you can do to improve, to bootstrap the learning of a joint model of that shared embedding. 
So in other words, all we really have to do is learn a complete mapping between the semantics of language and everything in the world, using language and percepts as lossy channels, um, which is actually a ridiculously huge problem. I basically just said all you have to do is solve language and at a minimum vision. And one of the ways that you can make this more feasible is pay attention to where your data is coming from. But once you understand that this is just a question of shared embeddings, of finding shared embeddings, there's a number of tricks you can play to make it work better. So one way of thinking about it, we're, we're, we're very fond of this sort of iceberg graph. This was the thing in talks for a number of years is, you know, we've worked on this little piece at the top and everything that's left to do is here below the surface. This is particularly popular in natural language settings. And my claim is that the problem is much more like this image on the right. Um, I don't know if everybody knows the tale of the blind men and the elephant. Briefly, someone sends, you know, a bunch of blind men to find out what an elephant is. And they come back with different impressions. One of them who's feeling the trunk says, an elephant is like a snake. It's long and it moves around. And one of them who's feeling a leg says, an elephant is like a tree. It's big and sturdy and rooted to the ground. And somebody who's feeling the side says, no, an elephant's more like a wall. These are all accurate, but incomplete because there's a shared embedding, the connection of what is an elephant to the real thing um, that we can only see bits and pieces of at any given time. So to give an example of how that can help, uh, one of the known problems with natural language in general is that machine learning needs negative examples, right? Uh, there's such a thing as positive unsupervised learning, but broadly speaking, negative examples are key for efficient learning. And we don't know how to get negative examples for natural language. And the reason we don't know is because first off, people very rarely say what something isn't. It's very rare for somebody to hold up a lemon and say, this is not a carrot. But for another, you, you can't get negative descriptions without prompting for them. And those descriptions are, that prompt is often a bit, if you hold something up and say, what isn't this? Um, that's a difficult problem for people. That doesn't, that's not very intuitive. But you can't take a lack of a positive label, label as a negative label because we don't describe things exhaustively. So I may, might say, this is a lemon. And we cannot take from that that this is not a fruit or this is not yellow or, you know, even after collecting a lot of data, we can't take that um, because, you know, there are lots of things that true that may happen to not be being mentioned then. So our solution to this is encode descriptions of objects as vectors in a semantic space. It's, the idea here is that similar descriptions give similar vectors. And we are encoding these descriptions as vectors without any semantic grounding at all. So this is a purely a natural language interaction based on descriptions that are given of things. And then calculate the cosine similarity, the cosine distance of the semantic vectors to give an object dissimilarity metric. So the idea is that objects with semantically distant descriptions are probably distant in the real world too because of this connection that we cannot see. So by operating purely on the natural language, uh, we can come up with, uh, here is how far apart the language describing this object, the language describing this object, the language describing this object. So from, this is a subset again of, of many, many terms. But here is the cosine similarity of a yellow banana from a data set and a bunch of other objects from the data set. And you can see this actually, unsurprisingly, if you think about how language works, does a pretty good job. You know, things that might be described as long and yellow or up towards the top. Something that is a, you know, a green banana is described the most like this yellow banana. And then down here towards the bottom where the vectors are semantically dissimilar, that is they're quite distant. Um, you've got things like a cabbage and a red semicylinder. And you can just take these objects as negative examples, as negative exemplars for the language 
and uh, language interpretation of the term banana. And that actually works really well. It works well because that shared embedding exists. So, and when I say well, I mean like here are some examples of words and the positive examples that people were asked to describe and then negative examples that are found automatically for the training. And, you know, I claim that the negative examples do a good job of capturing things that are not carrots, not red, not rectangular. And that claim is supported by the fact that when we actually run classification, when we're actually experimenting with, okay, have we learned grounded language well? Do our classifiers work well? Uh, using dissimilar objects as negatives substantially improves the outcome, substantially improves the results. Now, all of this so far, everything I have described has been mostly talking about these, rel these three classes, classes of relatively simple terminology. Objects, what is an object? What shape is it? What color is it? And that's quite limiting. So instead of just sticking with that, sticking with that sort of this limited concept, we want to talk about category-free learning. And by category-free learning, again, this is in the space of open set recognition. We're talking about words being associated with learned classifiers where the, those classifiers are not limited by preconceived categories of what kinds of words people might want to use. And that also is necessary for moving to this sort of more complex space of things. So what we have done to explore this is taken the well-known UW RGBD data set for now, um, which is a data set of several hundred objects in 50 categories, collected language descriptions of those objects, and extracted visual features that are not handcrafted here. Um, extracted visual features just by running, throwing everything into a CNN and removing the softmax function to expose the learned features. And then using those for the same kind of classifier learning, um, except instead of creating new classifiers in different categories, <clears throat> instead creating new classifiers based on just whatever those features tell us. So these are some examples of language that we collected doing this and um, you know the outcome of trying to do these categorizations. So here are some words that people used and whether our learned classifiers, our learned classifiers belief that it describes the objects here. So the first object is, you know, it's quite certain it's a cap and very certain it's a hat, but doesn't particularly think it's a green object. Um, and this, the full submission for this work is under review, so. Cross your fingers for us. This is a little more detail about the visual feature extraction. So, and it gives you some idea what makes, what makes sort of color and shape not particularly broad enough. Um, given an RGB image and a depth image that's created from the, from, you know, this is just, we're pointing at connected things and getting a fused depth image. Uh, this is an older connect. Our newer data uses the newest connect. Uh, but people say things like this is a ceramic cup. It's blue on the outside and white on the inside. And we don't have particularly a ceramics classifier. Uh, we don't have an aluminum classifier. We don't have a, we don't have a blue classifier, although we could. But we pre-process that language, create a bunch of grounded classifiers based on the terms that appear and apply that to objects in the world to get these sort of judgments for any given word, whether that word applies to an object. Um, the results are comparably competent to handcrafted features for a limited set of things. So we've successfully moved away from this kind of categories of objects only, and many, many more classifiers are created partly because it's a much more complex data set than we've previously been talking about. So this is just a sampling of how well different classifiers work over this data set. And again, this is based purely on a bunch of descriptions of, of each object 
gathered from Mechanical Turk. And I mean a bunch, right? We're talking about hundreds of descriptions per object, uh, which comes back to the sort of data-hungry nature of this formalism. So I think we have time to just run through. This is an older video, um, but I think it's still informative for what we're trying to comprehend. Um, I don't know if we're going to have sound or not, but it is subtitled. I'm ready. Okay, could you pick up the pepper and the green birch thing and this toy right here? And you can see on the screen in the back, um, what the robot is currently seeing, and we're using off-the-shelf speech recognition here, which was actually our biggest source of error in these experiments. But there's no pre-programming here. Everything that you're seeing, everything that you're seeing is learned from descriptions of objects that people have given. And we're operating, I've completely skipped over how we're dealing with gesture to provide traces of how language connects to the world. But we've got this, you know, sort of pick up this thing right here, please, or this toy here, I guess. So it does work. And I say it works, but I want to come back to the question of data collection, uh, because this is a significant problem more than a lot of artificial intelligence because we're looking at so many large spaces. For one thing, we have to keep research robots working for large N trials. That is, we've got to get a robot that performs the same across, ideally, you know, a hundred or multiple hundreds of participants. And those of you who have ever done anything touching on robots know that this is a significant issue. Um, the next problem is to make this really broad, to demonstrate that this is working beyond toy problems, we really want to collect data in different settings. Like we want to collect data in hospitals, we want to collect data in people's homes. And all of this requires getting robots into a setting, getting a variety of participants in those settings, getting permission to be there with a robot and, you know, experimenters, going through IRB approval for taking a robot into, for example, an elder care facility, um, which is not a trivial problem, and anything involving people. Anything where you need to bring in hundreds of people is a tremendous amount of, you know, contacting people, scheduling, bringing them in, realizing the camera is not working that day. And that's, of course, particularly true right now. This line of our research has sped up substantially because um, getting groups of people together to talk to a robot right now is a terrible idea for obvious reasons. So this leads to sort of a new research thrust that my lab has been really focusing on lately, uh, which I hope to convince you is really exciting, um, which is using the simulation to reality concept, the idea that robots can learn a lot in simulation and then apply it in the physical world with you know, some amount of additional retraining to the interactions from the robot's perspective. So sim to real has mostly been applied to physical problems like grasping, navigation, things where the robot is, you know, where a physics simulator covers what you're talking about. Uh, it doesn't necessarily draw on just the robot's perceptions of the environment. And insofar as Cinderella approaches have occurred in HRI, they're occurring almost entirely on training the human, on teaching a human how to interact with a robot or asking whether a human is comfortable with robots, less on whether humans are, what less on training a robot given data. So broadly, we've got, you know, a human and a robot in this context, and the human's perceiving the robot providing inputs through the simulated environment, which the robot is acting on given the virtual sensor interactions. The robot is perceiving the human in the simulated setting um, and the human is capable of perceiving the robot's movements and actions and speech. So broadly, this, this sort of triplet, this triplet, triptych explains what's going on. We've got a human here interacting with a robot. This is a person in a physical 
Uh, you can see down here at the bottom of this picture, this is a person in a physical uh, facility, which I'll describe briefly. Instructing a robotic partner. And here we're collecting everything a person does. We're collecting their speech, their gesture, their head posture, where exactly is their head turned, which we use as a proxy for gaze, for what they're looking at. Uh, the robot also has perceptions, and here the robot is seeing the world in both vision and depth. And this, you know, this is this perception is occurring in a saved scenario, which means that we can do things like add a sensor or add a camera elsewhere in the scenario after the fact, and then replay everything that's happening, but collect different data or additional data using possibly different noise models for the sensors, or even a different rendering engine to improve what's being seen. And when the robot has learned from enough settings like this where people are telling them what to do, transfer to the real world, transfer to a similar but non-identical setting, and demonstrate that the robot is capable of performing tasks um, using a vision technique, or a space of vision techniques called domain adaptation to help adapt to this real world setting. And of, you know, and you can do this using a lot of different tools of which the good old virtual reality headset uh, is still the most accessible. And that means it's accessible to people who don't have all the fancy tools I'm about to start talking to, about, uh, which is desirable for the future of robotics research uh, to make it generally more accessible. To build the scenarios, we're relying on a photogrammetry facility built at UMBC. And this is a set of 146 high resolution cameras that are wired up to all take a picture simultaneously. So you put someone or something in the middle of this rig, you can see it's a room size setup. Um, so you can put, for example, your participant in the middle of it and take a snapshot and get a reasonably high resolution virtual avatar of robots or unique objects or people um, that you can use to improve the fidelity of the simulation of what the robot is interacting with, instead of just using the same like three avatars for people. We're also using what's called the Pi squared, which is a virtual interaction space. It's somewhat like a cave. It's called a half cave. It's basically a big wall of a curved wall of thin bezel monitors that you stand in the center of and interact with what's going on. This is, uh, I, I, can, I can speak from experience, this is surprisingly immersive, especially when the background lights are off. And when we have people in that wall, we can do a lot of tracking. We can point connects and thermal cameras directly at them. We can track where they are in the space. If they're willing to use a pointing device and wear special glasses, uh, we can track their sort of head and gestures much more tightly without doing any interpretation at all. And that gives us, you know, sort of this interaction with the robot in a very realistic setting without any of the risks of things like nausea that come with head-mounted virtual reality. In order to make this work, uh, one of the things that we're heavily involved in right now is scenario development. The idea is that this gives us the ability to build a lot of scenarios very quickly. And we're working on doing exactly that in order to figure out, you know, how, how transferable is this? And these images on the left, this is our actual university cafeteria. Um, if, I, if you looked at this image for a moment and then I put you down at the correct spot in our cafeteria, you would know exactly where you were. Um, all of these objects are movable. A robot can do things like fill a plate with food for people. Uh, you can walk around in the environment. Uh, this was actually built from a previous project, and a good deal of work went into building this, uh, this scenario infrastructure. And that gives us the ability to take what we've learned and test it in the real world. And here on the right-hand side, we've got, you know, an artificially noisy hospital setting where you can direct the robot to move around in a hospital room, collect objects, gather sensor data. Um, we've got depth data for both. I'm just only showing it on the right-hand side. So this is my final slide. Uh, this is what is currently working. 
And it's important to me, at least, that the robot is being controlled, as those of you who are familiar with ROS can see, it's just being controlled through ROS. So we can use any of our standard toolkit to control how it moves, control its learning, um, all kinds of ROS interactions. And from doing that, uh, we, can, we can move it around in the space. Uh, here in the bottom right, you can see what the robot is seeing. You can see the reflection of the hospital light in the windows. I was a little freaked out trying to figure out why there was a generic circle in the sky. It turns out it's a reflection. It's supposed to be there. And this is what a person would be seeing in that scenario. So if you were standing there, you could say something like, go retrieve that water pitcher from the cabinet and point at it with a pointer to convey what you want the robot to do exactly. And all of this is intended to be shared widely with the community, the infrastructure that makes it possible to do this kind of data collection research in simulation. And I'll throw out a shameless plug here and say, if anybody listening to this talk has a virtual reality setup or headset or knows anyone who does, we are looking for participants in this. If you'd like to see it um, in actual, actually in practice. So, that's 45 minutes, which is plenty long enough to talk. Um, obviously, I've had the good fortune of working with a large number of really great collaborators and students. I haven't done all of this myself, including, as it happens, Mark. And with that, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak, and I'm happy to take any questions.